what? Why am I wearing a suit right now when this is a hunting vlog? Well, the whole point of our vlog was to take you on a typical day. What's going on guys? I am not wearing camouflage. I'm not wearing fishing gear. What is going on? Typically with these vlogs, we're doing hunting, fishing, putting together a diesel heater, something like that, something outdoors. But the whole point of the vlog was kind of take you on our weekly journeys. And this week for our job, I am doing public speaking. So I've got two speaking engagements this week, both at the same church. It's a wild game dinner. There'll be 500 people each night. And what's cool about this one, as opposed to talking about hunting, fishing, conservation, like I normally do, they've asked me to talk about my walk with God, how I found Jesus, and I'm excited about it to share that and talk about something different, you know, do something different. And with the vlog, we want you to see what it's like to be us. You know, outreach is a huge part of our brand and it's something I spend so much time doing, which is why I'm wearing a three piece as opposed to camouflage today. But hopefully the crowd likes it. Hopefully I don't screw this up and you enjoy it too. told me to dress for a wild game dinner, so I did. <laughs> I'm not sorry. <laughs> you went with a blue suit? Three. Blue? <laughs> with black shoes, you trash. <laughs> have to understand how things are up here. Jeffrey. Jeffrey. Everybody loves play. Church Wild Game Dinner welcome for Kyle Green. Give it up, everybody. Hello, everybody. Hi, Kyle. I want to thank you all for coming tonight to support this great cause. I got some time with Pastor Matt during dinner, and we were talking about all the national parks we love. And the national parks are beautiful places, and kids getting to experience the outdoors is what I am all about. He had mentioned that we have a TV show on the History Channel called The Greenway Outdoors. I'm the host. The other host is this crazy guy with the camera right there, Jeff. And we started this show with four best friends. We all got together with one goal, and that was to get more kids, Gen Z and millennials, into the outdoors, kind of like what Pastor Matt's doing with this program here. But the reason behind it for us was this. 60%, and you'll probably see this if you look around the room here, 60% of hunting and fishing licenses are sold to white males over the age of 55. And the problem with that is those beautiful national parks that we love that the kids are gonna go visit here, those national parks are funded by the sale of hunting and fishing licenses. On top of that, our clean water, we're all familiar with the Flint water crisis, that's being funded and being fixed by the sale of duck hunting licenses because that's what helps the clean water our fish stocking efforts, our clean forests, our species sustainability efforts, our anti-poaching efforts, the science that goes into making more white-tailed deer, white deer in North America than ever in recorded history is right now. And that's because of participating, buying our hunting license, go out and harvesting this year's surplus to make room for next year's fawns. The problem is, if 60% is coming from white males over the age of 55, what happens in 10 to 15 years? Where is that funding going to come from? And the problem with it really isn't small. The outdoor industry represents 3% of our nation's GDP. 3%. 
At one point, oil was below three. It's up right around seven right now, but that gives you an idea of how impactful it is. So we started the show because we wanted to inspire the next generation to get out and enjoy the outdoors. And in every episode, we include a Bible verse. Basically, if any of you have spent any time in the field, then you know you learn a lot of life lessons when you're outdoors and you're around God. So we always include that lesson in a Bible verse to plant what we call mustard seeds that grow into large trees and teach people about their faith. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to do here tonight. Normally, my speeches have a lot to do with that whole conservation thing I was talking about. But tonight, it's kind of exciting because I get to talk to you a little bit more about my journey with Christ. Now, it's, it's a great thing to have a wild game dinner like this because typically what happens is you get a lot of new people that maybe don't believe or they could use some rekindling to their faith. Now, I grew up in a household where I went to church every single Sunday. I have incredible parents and an incredible family. My parents are very much in love to this day. They go to church every Sunday. They instilled disciplines in me when I was a kid. I was spanked, if you can believe that. I don't know if you're allowed to say it anymore. Yeah, exactly. I was spanked, but I also knew that I was loved. And I learned about the Ten Commandments. I learned about God. But at the time of 18, every young man starts to think he knows everything. And when I got to that age, I thought to myself, you know, my parents told me to believe in Santa Claus. They told me to believe in the Easter Bunny, and that turned out to not be true. Sorry to ruin it for anyone in the room here. So why do I believe in God? And you'll learn quick with me, I'm a bit of a nerd. I had to get to the bottom of it. And hopefully there's someone out there right now thinking, yeah, why would you believe in God? And I'll tell you what, I'll save you the time because I did a ton of research and I came up with some very important points on why I began to believe. Now the first one, I went back to the creation of the universe. I went back to the Big Bang, which is what I was taught in school. And when I looked at the Big Bang, I realized that science was asking me to believe in a miracle. What they were telling me is everything came from nothing. What they were telling me is life came from non-life. Now, never in recorded history have we ever seen something come from nothing, and we have never seen life come from non-life. And if they are asking me to believe in that miracle, then they need to tell me where the miracle is coming from. And I realized quickly that they couldn't. So I put that one as a check on the God side for believing, because the Big Bang didn't seem to make sense. The next one for me was when I was looking at the planets, looking at how everything is. Did you know that if gravity was a little bit stronger, that the entire universe would implode into a ball and we would cease to exist? If gravity was just the least bit less strong, then everything would scatter away and we would cease to exist. So you have to understand the fact that gravity is precisely perfect. Precisely perfect. And that resonated with me that I either have to understand that that's the biggest lottery chance ever, or what seems a little bit more reasonable is that there was a design to it. On top of that, when I stepped away from that, I got into what else I learned in school. I learned about evolution. Now, again, for science not believing in God, these people want me to love miracles. So the next miracle I got to learn was species got to change into a different species. Even though we have no record of that whatsoever, there's no scientific proof to it whatsoever. So wait a second. I have to believe that life again came from non-life and on top of that switch species. Now, there is an evolution that is true. And that is when you get into DNA code. So when I broke down what evolution is true, Imagine this, if all the frogs in the world had one leg, but one frog had a genetic mutation which gave it two legs, which can happen. It's still a frog, but now it has two legs. Well, that frog can hop better. That frog can escape predators better. That frog can eat, hunt better. That frog can mate better. So that frog is probably going to succeed and pass its genetic mutation down to its kids. And those kids are going to continue to pass it down, and so on and so forth. You go ahead 500 to 1,000 years, and all of a sudden, all the frogs have two legs, because those were the ones that survived. Now, that evolution we've seen, 
But at the same token, wait a second, DNA. Now, DNA is a code. Our supercomputers today can't create it. It's too complex. We can't even remotely get there. But what code do you know of that wasn't created, that wasn't written? It's perfect. So why is that? So now I've got it like 4-0 going for believing in God. On top of that, we know that I hunt and fish all over the world, right? So one of the things that I do when I'm out there is I'm witnessing God's beautiful creation. And there's a Bible verse that says, proof of God's existence is so obvious in his creation that there is no excuse not to see it. Meaning that the creator, God, went so out of his way to make it obvious to us that he was there that we wouldn't have a reason to ignore it. We're in a busy, crazy, loud, social media loving, crazy world. Politics are going crazy. People are turning away from God. We're getting into a time where everything is so loud and noisy. But if you get out in nature and view it, which is why I'm so excited the kids, because of you guys here tonight, will get to experience that, you will see God's creation. One of the things I noticed when I was goose hunting one time, those of you who have never been goose hunting, and that's a meat we might want to add to the list one time, and there's plenty of them right now. We were out snow geese hunting, and those of you who don't know, snow geese fill the sky. Hundreds of thousands of them migrate every year. And it got me thinking, why do these animals have the instinct to migrate north and south? It doesn't even really make all that much sense. They could just stay in the warm area, have their nest there, have their eggs there, have their food there. They would be fine. And I got to thinking, not as God, but if I was to design something, I would say it would make a lot of sense if I had a lot of people spread out over a big area and I needed all of them to be able to harvest meat and food. What can I do to make that happen? So God made it with instincts that animals migrate. So they're covering big, vast expanses of land so everybody can harvest meat. That is just one of many things. And that might even be, again, not that bright, just kind of a nerd. So that might even be one of the more obvious ones, but there's a lot more out there. So then I got to, okay, obviously there's a God. Okay, so let's dive back into the Bible. So then I'm like, okay, I had people say this. The Bible was written over hundreds of years and all these different people and they took out stuff or they added stuff. Well, in my research, I found that the Bible itself has 65,000 cross-references in it. 65,000. And the best part, not one of them contradict the other. Amen. Think about that. 65,000. How complex is that? It's like building a pyramid. On top of that, if that's not enough, that technically makes it the first hyperlink book ever made. And I think that that's pretty cool. So then as I dove into the Bible, I got to the story of the flood. And I'm like, okay, finally, my nerd brain can get into this, something that should be provable, right? Now, I've got a pretty good story for you. I read the Noah's Ark story. I read all of the Bible verses that are around it to try and understand it. And it says that the mountains rose out of the waters at the end of the flood. Rose out of the waters quickly. So... I don't know if you know this, but do you know what they found on the top of Mount Everest? When they got up there, they found petrified clams on top of Mount Everest. They found proof of sea life on top of Mount Everest. Now, okay, maybe the earth was just completely different and that doesn't necessarily prove the Bible. But here's the thing, as we know, climate change in general takes place over long expanses of time. But when they found the clams, the clams were closed, which means it had to happen quick. If you go along the beach and you find seashells, right? Good luck finding a matching pair because they get scattered all about. What happens when a clam dies is it opens up and releases. And that's why they split into two. And that's why you find clam shells that way. But in this case, they were all closed shut, which means it happened fast and they were buried alive, which hints towards receding waters. Recently, scientists in Turkey which is roughly where the Bible says the mountaintop is that Noah's Ark landed on, we believe. They believe that they found Noah's Ark. Now, I can't say that that is for sure true. 
And the people figuring out if it was Noah's Ark right now, I don't necessarily even trust. But they think that they may have found it, and it's going to take 100 plus years to figure out if they actually did. I have no doubt that that's the case. So the Bible tells me God's real. The science tells me God's real. But why Jesus? Why Jesus, right? Because, okay, I can, you get a lot of people that say, I'm spiritual. Oh, I believe in God, but it's all the same. Your God's my God, that God. Why is Jesus significant? So this is what got me, this specific story. So we all know about the disciples. God wrangled up a bunch of people, no better than the next, to follow him and give his word. Those of you who know the story, Jesus was crucified on what we call Good Friday as Christians. Now, on Good Friday, Jesus was abandoned by his disciples. They fled in fear. They all forsaked him out of terror for losing their own life. Okay? The, these disciples did that. Jesus was crucified. Those of you who know Easter Sunday, he rose again on the third day, and then he interacted with the disciples again and came back and was like, told y'all. He got there. And he said, go ahead and touch me. It is me. I have risen. I have done what I told you I would. Now still, that's I'm reading a book, right? There are so many people that were not Christian. There were so many people that didn't believe Jesus was God that documented Jesus' Jesus's existence. That's a tough one to say. Jesus' existence. They documented and said, yes, he was crucified. On top of that, they have documented that the disciples fled. Now, after he came back to life and said, look at me, I'm alive, the disciples spread out, went around to preach the good news that Jesus rose again with a whole new fire in their belly, probably really happy he's so forgiving after they left his side in the first place. Now, this is where it gets interesting, and this, is, this has been covered by so many people, again, that aren't religious. The disciples... After preaching God's word, all died terrible, terrible deaths. So the first one was, I'm sorry, Pete, yeah, Paul was beheaded. Thomas was speared to death. Okay? And Peter was crucified himself. All the disciples had to do was say that Jesus wasn't God, that what they believed wasn't true. And they would have saved their own life again like they did on Good Friday. But after they saw him come back, they were willing to die. So you've got these men that were scared to die when they didn't believe, but happily willing. Now the coolest one, if you want to use cool as a word, is Peter, who was crucified like Jesus. But he said, I am not worthy to be crucified the way Jesus was. Do it upside down. Imagine the faith that these guys must have had after they saw Jesus come back. And again, that isn't just biblical. That's people that don't believe in God because there's people out there that were cheering that those deaths took place and those men were willing. So that is where I found Jesus. And if you are going to find Jesus and decide to believe, then I said, you know what? Let's go to his biggest speech, the Sermon on the Mount. You can Google it, by the way. You can Google Sermon on the Mount, and it's like a nine-minute read. Not very hard to do. And basically, it's an outline on how you should live life. Now, I pulled one section of it out because I think it's very important, and it's what really helped me in life. And that is, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be open. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, if you then are evil, but you know how to take care of your children and give good gifts, how much will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? So... When you really break that down and read it for what it is, he says, ask, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And when he talks about who, even, even the wicked know how to give their children good gifts. Imagine God 
who loves you more than even your parents ever could, who designed all of these things, which we can prove through science, gave you all those things. Imagine the gifts he would give to you if you just asked him. Now, in order to share my personal story, I'm kind of diving in like halfway through. But we started this television show with just my best friends and I, uh, four of us. We pooled all of our money together, and we had one goal, and that was to sell more hunting and fishing licenses to the youth so that we could have this beautiful landscape in the future and take care of God's creation and also plant those mustard seeds for God. We all came together with one mission and one goal. And as we were going through it and the fights and the struggles and the difficulties, because when you're working on something good, Satan attacks the most, especially if it glorifies the kingdom. We were going through these difficult times, but at the same time, we never lost faith. We actually were offered sponsorships. We were offered TV deals. We were offered different opportunities. As long as we took the Bible verse out of the show, we never, ever did. Amen. We remained loyal to that. Now, that doesn't make us stronger than anyone else. It just means, like the disciples, they were willing to be crucified over it. I just knew if we abandoned God, we were no longer seeking him, and we would no longer find what we were looking for. And the test didn't stop. There came a time where we had pooled all of our money. We were working full-time during the day and then full-time during the night, sleeping six hours and waking up the next day to do it. As we continued to deny deals and not get to the next level that we needed, we depleted our funds. We got to the point where we were drinking protein shakes and water. We were kicked out of a building. Terrible things happened to us. And I'll never forget this one time and this is where I learned this lesson. It got to the point where it was so bad, we didn't have any money left to keep going. So we didn't know what we were going to do. And I went to bed on November 29th, 2018, and I said a prayer to God that I read in the Bible. And it said that if you say to God, God, I am not testing you, but I am coming to you and I am asking you to reveal yourself to me. Show me you. I am seeking you. Reveal yourself in my life. And I, I, I led that prayer, like I said, on November 29th, 2018. About seven months prior, I had a meeting with a company called Ram Trucks. And we put a proposal in front of them to be one of our sponsors at the time. And I followed up with them, as you can imagine, quite a bit. And seven months went by, and I heard nothing back. And we had pretty much wrote it off, even though I followed up bi-weekly. I was like coming up with creative stuff, sending gifts baskets, you know, whatever I could do to stay in front of them. I went to their office one day. They probably thought I was a creeper at one point. On November 30th, 2018, I woke up after giving that prayer, probably about 8 o'clock in the morning, and I received an email from the leader at Ram Trucks and said, we have decided to move forward with you, and this was a six-figure deal. This was life-changing for us. Completely puts us in a different realm. As long as, in the next 30 days, all the episodes you filmed, you can include a Ram truck, a new model, because I had an old model, a new model Ram truck in every single episode will sign with you. So that afternoon, we went to the dealership, bought a new truck, and started driving south because we had snow in Michigan, and we needed to make the climate look like it did in the summer episodes. So we drove south and did that. And I'll never forget the overwhelming excitement and happiness to know that God glorified the mission and what we were doing that day because I sought him and I found him. And ever since then, God has given us our daily bread to continue to go to the next level. Year after year, the company continued to grow. God continued to bless us. And I will say this, we, had our, we finally signed our big network deal about a year and a half ago. We launched on the History Channel. And imagine, uh, and I think I can say this in the room with all the guns, gun-carrying Christian conservative television show on mainstream television is not exactly super welcomed. <laughs> but at the same time, we finished fourth overall on the network and had no less than 1.3 million views per episode. <laughs> a 
After the second week, we're assigned for an additional season, and we'll be launching again our second season, and we're in the middle of filming it right now in October of this year on the History Channel, and glory to God for that because I found it in Him. And the real goal today, I hope, was to inspire you guys out there that if you have doubts about God, the science points to God. If you, have doubt, if you seek God and you pray that exact prayer, God, reveal yourself to me. He will. I hope that someone here will have that same experience. But above and beyond that, this is kind of the lesson that I took from all of this. We're made in God's image. What is God? Well, God is a creator. So that means we're all creators. We live in a world now where depression is rampant. People are upset. People are going to jobs that they hate and doing things that they despise. Here's what I will tell you. If you have a goal, no matter how big, how small, and you seek God in that goal, and it is for good, and you wake up every single day and give everything you have to it, you will find yourself happier immediately because we are creators like God working towards those goals. And that's what I learned in this. And that's why I wanted to share with each and every one of you tonight. I hope this touched someone's heart. I hope it makes you realize we're all going through something. You know, we're, I feel like we're on the top of the world now, but just a few short years ago, we were at the bottom of the world. If you're at the bottom now, you can climb out when you seek God. Thank you guys so much. Well, you know, Abraham Lincoln's first speech, I'm sure, was nothing like the Gettysburg Address, but practice makes perfect. Hopefully the next one's a little better. Thanks for tuning in.